sign in and find a seat, grab your written materials if you haven't printed them from the website or from the email that you got. We really appreciate it uh, when you do that, when you download the materials so that we don't have to make as many copies as we did previously. I think by the time we get into the so maybe this time next year, we're going to go completely paperless, so we're trying to ease everybody into that. So the more you can get used to downloading the materials, I think the better off we will all be. So thanks for doing that for those of you who do it. And before we begin the program, Ben has an announcement about the Woodward Capital. I uh, get an afternoon one. Uh, just a quick couple of announcements. First one, uh, there is a happy hour tonight at Sidebar just across the street. We appreciate it all the time. Uh, enjoy uh, drinks and uh, appetizers. And the other announcement is that we have an update date for our annual bowling tournament. That's the October 24th. Uh, Lucky Strike. Um, Details are on the website. Free registration is required uh, because we are very limited on the number of bowlers that we can accommodate. Uh, but it's again, it's going to be October 24th at Lucky Church. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that under Section 11, the bowling tournament is going to be a voluntary recreational activity. So don't anybody get hurt at the bowling tournament. You're, you're probably not covered. Uh, Do we get CLE credit for the bowling tournament? Um, so, Grand Stats, whether uh, there's going to be CLE credits or the home tournament, I tell you what, anybody who bowls a 300 game, you get, I'll give you 10 hours of credit for a 300 game, okay? So, check in with me after that. All right, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Again, we're already looking to be scheduling the 2020 programs, the June time so called brown bag programs here in the auditorium. Unless we hear any real strenuous objection in the next few days, we're probably just going to keep the schedule that we had this year, which is the last Thursday of the month when that Thursday is available to us. It seems that that last Thursday of the month has the fewest downstate venues in session on that particular day. So that's why we picked the last Thursday of the month. I know there's a lot of stuff going on, on up on the 8th floor on the last Thursday of the month, but that kind of means you're here anyway. So you might as well, you know, walk walk down here at noon when you're breaking for lunch. So unless we hear some overwhelming strenuous objection here in the next very short little while, we're probably just going to book the room for the last Thursday of the month, okay? Anybody want to make that strenuous objection right now? Does this seem to be working for everybody? I think it's really difficult, of course, to you know, satisfy everybody's schedule. We can't, we can't do that, but we're trying to kind of make it uh, most convenient for the most of you, okay? All right, good, thanks. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about a review of recent commission decisions, and these commission decisions come in the August summary that you should have received in your email inbox a few weeks ago. Of course, we're going to try to continue to do that every month. We're going to have a summary of a dozen or so recent commission decisions that all WICLA members will get. And then, depending on the schedule of these programs and what topics we're going to do every once in a while, maybe once every quarter or so, we'll visit some of those commission decision summaries so that we can do a, a deeper dive into those cases and discuss them here in this room where there's, where there's a lot of collective wisdom about these things and maybe kind of pick up on some themes or some developments that are happening at the Workers' Compensation Commission that will affect issues that you're currently working on so that you can see the current, most current thinking of the Workers' Compensation Commission on issues that you're working on. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to try to look at the August summaries and do a deeper dive into those cases and pick up on some themes that seem to be running through these cases. So the first case that we want to talk about is Marble Hawkins versus Georgetown Ridge Farms 
consolidated unit school district number four. And this is a 2018 commission decision as you can see from this site here on the slide. So in this particular case, what the Workers' Compensation Commission did was to affirm and adopt the arbitrator's denial of benefits for a fall down the stairs, okay? So this is a case that the petitioner loses, all right? The petitioner is a loser in this case when she falls down the stairs at work. And I say at work because I think, according to the facts as I read them, the stairs were on the inside of the building where she worked, which was a school, as far as I can tell, and clearly the employer's premises, right? So this is not a case where it was out in the parking lot. If this is not a case where the stairs were somehow removed from the employer's premises, we're gonna see a case like that here in, in a few slides. This is on a, a staircase on the employer's premises. According to the petitioner's testimony, she is wearing sandals on that day. She catches her sandal on the stair, and I, I, I'm gonna take a minute here in a second to, to read you her testimony because I think it's very interesting the way the testimony went in. She falls down the stairs after catching her sandal and injures her knee. She says that she did the stairs twice per day, and I think what that means is entering, you know, going down the stairs, I mean, at the beginning of the day, and leave, ascending the stairs at the end of the day. I think that's what this means by twice per day. You know, we talk about some cases here where it's not very clear. The petitioner says, I did those stairs twice a day, and that means like once up and once down, and then again once up and once down, right? So, and especially because we're gonna be talking about the quantitative neutral risk analysis, I think it's really important to make clear exactly what that means, right? I did it twice a day, does that mean up and down? Or does that mean, you know, up and then down? You know, so just keep that in mind as we're looking at these cases. She says there was no foreign substance on, on these stairs, so this wasn't a case where there was grease or coffee or water or something else on the stairs. Um, it was nice weather outside, according to her, so there was no water being tracked in as far as I can tell. And she says she's carrying a bag. And the reason why I have a question mark here is because there was some testimony that you're gonna see when you read the decision about whether that bag was work-related, right? She's a teacher and she works with children um, who she gives um, cereal treats to, right? And so, like Cheerios, right? So she, she's apparently carrying a bag that has a Cheerio box in it, right? So that she can reward her students when they do a good behavior or whatever. She gives them a Cheerio or whatever, whatever it is. So I, the reason I have a question mark here is because, you know, we have those cases about carrying objects, right, and how that affects fall down the stairs, especially when the objects are work-related, right, like work files, you know, and in the physical case, the guy was carrying knives to cut the cookies up with or, or whatever it is, right? So there's a question in this case about the bag and whether what was in the bag was work-related, and it, it doesn't seem very clear, at least to me, from the uh, decision. So I do want to just take a second, though, because the arbitrator makes a big thing in his decision, and I don't mean that in a negative way. He makes a, it's an important point to the arbitrator in the decision that the petitioner is not clear about why she fell, right? So here, here's what the arbitrator says. In this case, the claimant did not present any evidence explaining the cause of her fall. She testified that she does not know why she fell. Specifically, trial testimony was as follows. And then, this is a case where the arbitrator thinks it's important enough to actually cite the trial testimony. Question, is it fair to say that you don't know how you fell? Well, no, not really, is the answer. Question, okay. Answer, I caught my foot on something. I know that that happened. I don't just get to the top of the stairs and decide you're going to fall down and something happened that caused me to fall. I've never fallen, you know, in my life. 
I know that I'm older, and I realize that people, you know, fall down when they get older, but that isn't what happened. I mean, I absolutely did something to make myself, you know, to cause the fall. But do you know what got caught? Answer, my, the toe of my shoe was caught. It was an accident. The toe of my shoe was caught, and I went forward. So, the arbitrator says that that testimony is not sufficient for him to draw the inference that that was the cause of, or the conclusion that that was the cause of the fall. He, the arbitrator makes an important distinction between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence, and I'm sure that there's an argument that could be made that when the petitioner says something like, I absolutely know what caused me to fall, that that's not necessarily circumstantial evidence, that that's, that might be by some people considered to be direct evidence. But in any event, the arbitrator said that because the evidence was circumstantial, he could not draw the conclusion of what caused the petitioner to fall. He says that the fall was not due to an employment-related risk, right? We, we beat this dead horse a lot, the three kinds of risks, personal risk, employment risk, neutral risk. The arbitrator says this is not an employment risk because the petitioner did not present any evidence explaining the cause of the fall. She testified that she does not know why she fell. I think the petitioner would say, I think I told you why I fell. In any event, the, the arbitrator decides that because of that, this is not an employment risk. So the arbitrator goes on to do the next analysis, right? We know when it's not an employment-related risk that it might be a neutral risk that could turn into an employment-related risk, right? So the arbitrator does the neutral risk analysis, right? Everybody knows, because we beat the dead horse a lot here, but how are the two ways to turn a neutral risk into an employment-related risk, right? Qualitative and quantitative. So here's what the arbitrator says about that, right? Petitioner did not show that qualitatively she was performing an employment-related task when she was injured. She was not performing any task for her employer. She was walking like any member of the general public. So that's the basis on which the arbitrator finds that this is not a, the kind of qualitative neutral risk that leads to compensability, all right? So qualitative neutral risk analysis fails for this petitioner according to the arbitrator. Likewise, qualitatively, and I think the arbitrator here meant quantitatively, right? Because he was uh, trying to establish some distinction between what he had just said, right? And he had just talked about qualitatively. So I think this is just a, a typo in the decision. I think what he meant to say was quantitatively because of what follows. She presented no evidence. She used the stairs in question more than a member of the general public, right? So when we hear language about like that, more than a member of the general public, that's a, that's a quantitative analysis, right? I, I think most people would uh, agree with that. The entrance she used was open to the general public. The door she entered through was the only door at the school that was unlocked all day. I, I think the arbitrator means that last sentence to be a negative when it comes to the compensability, but there may be an argument to be made that that's what actually makes it a positive for compensability, right? That was the only door that was unlocked all day. She, that was the only door that she knew at that time would absolutely be unlocked, right? Some of the other doors might not have been unlocked. So I'm not sure I understand exactly why the arbitrator mentions that as, a, as what seems to be a negative aspect for the compensability of the case, when I think there is an argument to be made that that potentially is a positive to the um, aspect. So if you, if, if you are trying to prepare a client for testimony, or you're trying to <coughs> Prepare a cross-examination of a petitioner in a, in a staircase. 
take a look at the way the petitioner's testimony went down in this case, okay? Because there, you, you may be able to pick up some pointers about how to either from, you know, depending on what perspective the have, petitioner or respondent, how to kind of fill it in or make it better, or, you know, it, it, from a respondent's point of view, stress the things that will get you a finding like here in the Hawkins case. Yes? First of all, finding these against the manifest way of the evidence. Well, I, 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 I guess we'll see about that because, in fact, in this case, the uh, petitioner did file a, a review to the circuit court in Vermilion County. And as far as I can tell, that circuit court review is still pending in Vermilion County. So we're going to find out soon enough. Can I just make a comment? What is the definition of direct evidence? Not circumstantial. Direct evidence is something the witness sees, observes, or feels. When the woman says she caught her foot, I'd love to add this one to the appellate court, because it wouldn't be my first dance with the commission when they start making decisions against the manifest way of the evidence. When she says, I felt my foot catch on the stair, that's direct evidence because it comes to a sensory feeling in her foot. That is not circumstantial evidence. That's direct evidence. Now, the arbitrator can only reject that evidence under Illinois law if it's totally unbelievable or he finds her somehow lack of credibility. Now, in finding a lack of credibility, they must enunciate some reason why this testimony is credible or not credible. I had a doctor at the uh, arbitrator so it's not credible, but apparently the appellate court felt he was credible. I mean, we really have to ask our arbitrators, please go back and read the rules of evidence if you're going to make rulings. Now, he may have come to the same conclusion, but at least he should have followed the law. This is not circumstantial evidence. I can bet my life on that. Thank you for your time. Yes. Agreed. I think everybody here can agree with that. The question is whether or not what she said described a work-related <coughs> accident. In other words, what did she step on? So, she didn't so, say what she so, said. So Mark's point is... It could just is, be a bad step. So, so Mark's point... So, so, so that's Mark's point, right? Mark, Mark's point is, okay, let's say you believe the petition. Let's say, let's say you believe her and that it's absolutely 100% true and it's direct evidence that what happened was she caught the toe of her sandal on a perfectly level, perfectly pristine stair, right? We don't is that, know. We don't is know. it? We don't know. Well, yes, well, well I'm, telling you, I'm telling you to assume it. Let, let's assume, let, let's do a hypothetical, right? Let's assume that that's what happened, that she caught her toe on the, on the stair, right? The toe of her sandal on the stair, right? She's in the course of her employment, we know that, right? This wasn't an in the course of case, this was an arising out of the case. It's catching your toe, catching the, the, the toe of your sandal on a stair, compensable. No. You can make an inference that there had to be something wrong with the stair. Okay, so, but even, even not, take that inference out of it. Take, take that inference out of it. It's catching your sandal on a stair. When you're in the course of your employment and you're on your employer's premises and you catch the toe of your sandal on the stair, okay, is that compensable? Right? I, so, so it's, Mark gives me the meds and meds, right? Eh, I don't know, right? Right? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, that's what's causing all the confusion among us practitioners, right? When, when, a, when a fact pattern is stated with that much certainty, and we can split right down the middle about whether that's compensable or not, I think that we need some clarification about what the law is, right? Because I would argue, from my biased perspective, admittedly, that how can that not be compensable? How can that not be compensable, right? How can that not be compensable? You got Elliot. She's 
No, she's got to show the cause of her fall, right? She's got to show the cause of her fall, right? She doesn't, right? Those, those, those situations where the person is hurrying, right? The situation where the person is hurrying, they don't show that there's anything wrong with the stair, and that's compensable nonetheless. But, but the stair is inherently not dangerous. How do you do something about that? I think I have been to a common law defense. No, but that's 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 work of common law. I, I so so what Mark what Mark says is that we shouldn't even be analyzing stairs as a neutral risk because they're not a risk, right? I mean, but, but, but 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 the word the word the phrase neutral risk includes the word risk, right? So so and the, and the appellate court has told us that many times, right? Climbing up and down stairs is a neutral risk. It's not a neutral nothing, it's a neutral risk. So, anyway. Yeah, I, I think we're going down the rabbit hole. We are. If you just mentioned Mark, something. <laughs> Mark, when I, when I see a case like this, and, and I, I say, if it's 100% true that she caught her sandal and on the stair, and she falls down the stairs on her employer's premises, and that's not compensable, I'm so far down the rabbit hole that I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to get out. I'm not disagreeing with okay, what I'm saying good. is that it could have been just been a bad step, too. She just took an awkward step, and she caught, she felt her toe. Okay, so, so that, that brings up an interesting point, right? Mark brings in the, I don't know, some people might call that comparative fault argument, right? Right? Oh, it's caterpillar. She, she took a bad step. It's a caterpillar right? argument. Mark, again, I, I hope that Andy Marzell, is Andy Marzell here? Caterpillar was not on Caterpillar's premises, right? That guy was not on Caterpillar's premises. He was on a public sidewalk. So anyway, let's 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 move on. Okay? Thanks. So let's move on to the to the lowest one case. Alright? So here's another case that the petitioner loses for a fall. This one happens in a parking lot. Okay, and what's different about this case is that in this case the arbitrator said this is a compensable fall, all right, and the commission takes it away and says it is not a compensable fall. So let's look at the, take a quick look at what the arbitrator um, says here. So the facts in this case are she's uh, Ms. Wan is a, a technician at the hospital and she's leaving work for the day. She's in the hospital uh, parking lot number three. She was not assigned to a specific parking lot. She could park in any lot. By the way, I think any lot means any lot that is owned by the respondent, right? So these, whatever, whether it's lot one, lot two, lot three, these are all respondent parking lots. This isn't a strip mall or anything like that, right? This is a respondent uh, parking lot. Petitioner could park in any lot. She could but chose parking lot three because it was the most convenient lot for her. Um, respondent suggested, but did not order her to park in that lot. Petitioner was provided instructions on where to enter and exit the building. She used an emergency exit to enter and exit the building. Not accessible to the general public. She required a badge, she didn't do that door. Um, Petitioner leaves work, just walk out to her car, it was cold and dark outside. The area was not wet, there was no snow or ice, or the, the, the decision says precipitation, you know, to cover the nukage angle, right? No, no precipitation. It wasn't wet, either by means of snow or by means of uh, rainwater or any other kind of water. There was a difference of one to two inches between the sidewalk and the area where she fell that was not even. Petitioner stepped on the slope area of the black top, tripped and fell. Okay, so that those are the, the, the facts. The arbitrator decides in favor of the petitioner in this case and says that not only was the spot where the petitioner tripped on uneven ground, but it was also encountered in darkness when she left her work shift at 7 a.m. Those facts together expose the petitioner to a risk of tripping greater than that encountered by the general public. So I think that this arbitrator is saying that this is an employment-related risk, right? But even if not, 
Perhaps it's a neutral risk. Quantitative analysis with this idea that, you know, tripping greater than that encountered by the general public. Any which way the arbitrator decides the compensation uh, should be awarded to the petitioner in this case. Listen to what the respondent argues, because we've seen this argument come up in other cases that we've talked about here, right? Respondent argues that the petitioner's accident did not arise out of her employment because she took the, the route that she took to the parking lot was of her quote unquote own choice, right? So we've heard that before, right? Well, it was a better route that she could have taken. Or, you know, the better route off the loading dock is not jumping off the loading dock, it's going down the, the ramps on the side, right? So we've heard those arguments before. So here's one of those themes that we can see running through cases, right? Where respondents are saying the alternative route that the petitioner chose was not the safest route, was not the best route, was not the quickest route, and somehow that should defeat compensability. In this case, the arbitrator disagrees with that analysis. But hold on, because the Workers' Compensation Commission swoops in and reverses the arbitrator's decision and takes away the benefits from the petitioner. And here's what the commission says about that, right? The arbitrator's finding of a hazard or defect is erroneous, okay? They don't say, we, we look at the uh, you know, facts differently, right, and there's a slight difference of opinion here. They say, the arbitrator got this one wrong. It is erroneous that that slope or that uh, uneven pavement was uh, some kind of hazard or defect, and that's why the uh, petitioner should not receive benefits. Because here's what the arbitrator had said. It is clear from the evidence that the uneven surface between the sidewalk and the asphalt parking lot where the petitioner fell was a hazard or defect. So the arbitrator, in his, in his mind, it was clear that that was a hazard or defect, right? And in the commission's mind, it was clear that that finding was absolutely erroneous. Here's what the commission says. Here are the height differential diminishing toward the access ramp at the end of the sidewalk between the curb and the blacktop was by design and was not a defect. So I think what the commission is saying is that if that's what it was, right, if it was just what it was, <coughs> that can never be a hazard. So, right? I, I, I don't know, right? And, and, and people laugh when, and people laugh when I try to uh, be an extremist, but but I mean I, I don't I don't know how you can read that. Here the height differential between the curb and the blacktop was by design and was not a defect. Okay? So if if that's what it is and it's designed that way, right, it cannot be compensable when you trip over that thing that is designed that way. As there was no defect, special hazard or risk on the respondent's premises. So again, I, I may be overanalyzing this, but somehow or another, the commission has slipped in special hazard, right? Now not only is it hazard, now it's a special hazard that the petitioner needs to show, okay? And because of that, the commission finds that the petitioner has failed to prove her injury arose out of any court, that arose out of her court. Okay, so be careful about your parking lot cases, right? You're gonna, you're gonna encounter, from a petitioner's point of view, and respondents, I'm sure you're gonna be making this argument, right? The alternative route argument, there was a better way to go. Keep, keep that in mind, right? And be careful about this, you know? There was nothing wrong with that thing over which the petitioner tripped. It was designed that right? Yes. No, no mention of the darkness aspect of it? Not, not, in, the, not in the commission's decision, right? Not in the commission's decision. So, so in the commission's decision, the, the arbitrator found, right, the arbitrator said those factors, right, those facts together, the uneven ground encountered in darkness, the arbitrator says those facts together expose the petition, right? As far as I can tell, there's no mention of the darkness in the
commission's reversal of the arbitrator's so award. This is the circuit court as well? This one is, uh, yes, in the circuit court in Sangamon County, um, and it's kind of a briefing schedule right now. Okay. All right, any questions, concerns, issues about this one? Could somebody go over to the circuit court and the public court, the Supreme Court, and explain to them that there's no cause of action for the design defect? Yes, and I'm nominating you. Let's move on to the Travis Lupino uh, versus State of Illinois case, uh, Liquor Control Commission. So in this case, the commission affirms and adopts an arbitrator's award to a traveling employee who is a liquor inspector, which is the job I want to apply for. It sounds like my dream job, being a liquor uh, inspector. Um, who goes out to bars, apparently, or liquor stores, and examines the premises or whatever. He's an inspector. He's out at one of those sites and falls down the stairs at an, an off-premises site, let's say, right? So this is different than the Hawkins case where we looked at where the stairs were on-premises, right? In this case, it's an off-premises uh, stairway. So what's interesting to me about this case is that there, there's a special concurring opinion from one of the commissioners, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that because it brings up a point or a theme that we've seen run through some of these other cases. So first of all, let's talk about what the arbitrator says, right? The arbitrator says that the commissioner's a traveling employee, right? His job as an inspector requires him to go from bar to bar, right? Which is what I do most nights, right? Go, go from bar to bar. And, um, you know, to inspect the bars, and so because for that reason, he's a traveling employee. So when he falls down the stairs at one of the bars, right, you use the traveling employee risk analysis, right? Everybody knows what that is, reasonable and foreseeable to the respondent, that he would fall down the stairs at one of these sites, right? You're not doing an employment-related <coughs> risk analysis. You're not doing a neutral risk analysis. When you're talking about a traveling employee, you're doing this reasonable and foreseeable. Is it reasonable, foreseeable that a liquor inspector is going to fall down the stairs at one of the bars? Yes, it is. Therefore, compensable, right? Case closed. So the commission um, affirms and adopts that decision, but one of the commissioners thinks it's important enough to tell us that there's a different theory that should be applying to this case. And let, let's talk about why, because it's something that we've seen in some other cases recently, right? Here's what the special concurring opinion that affirms the award of benefits says. As petitioner was neither traveling nor on the street when this injury occurred, I find such analysis inapplicable, right? So the traveling employee analysis is not applicable, according to this commissioner, when the traveling employee arrives at the site where he was both, right? Remember we talked about this in a, in a case previously? This idea that we, that you know that, that respondents sometimes try to argue that when a traveling employee arrives at the place to which he was traveling, he takes off the special protection of being a traveling employee, right? Because he's arrived at the destination. That's what this commissioner is suggesting should be the case here, right? Because he arrived at the bar, right? When he walks into the bar, he's no longer a traveling employee. But the neutral risk analysis still says that he should get benefits because going out to bars, he's required to climb up and down the stairs on a quantitative basis more than the general public, right? So in this particular case, the Commissioner says it doesn't make a difference whether it's a traveling employee or not a traveling employee because the neutral risk analysis still demands compensation or still requires compensation for this particular petitioner. But I suppose one could imagine a case where if the petitioner didn't have the traveling employee protection, right, that there might be a case where when he arrives at the destination where he's supposed to be going to, that the neutral risk analysis doesn't apply to him. Certainly the employment risk analysis doesn't apply to him, right? Because it's not his employer's premises. Right? It's not his employer's premises. 
I suppose he can argue on the or I'm just carrying my toolbox or whatever it is. But he's not going to be able to make an employment premises argument, right? There was something wrong with those stairs. The employer is going to say, so what? They weren't our stairs, right? So I suppose you can imagine a case where if this guy is not a traveling employee, his fall down the stairs might not be compensable under a neutral risk analysis. So it's just something to keep in mind because we've seen this idea now at least a couple of times in cases that we've analyzed here where it's this idea that a traveling employee, when he gets to or she gets to where she's going, is no longer a traveling employee. Right? Okay? Everybody understand it? Questions, concerns, comments? Yes. Okay. Hey, yes. What about the, I mean, the factual inaccuracy of that? The traveling employee's trip is over when they return to their home. I mean, planes, trains, and automobiles. When does Steve Martin's trip end? So Sean, so Sean, yeah, Sean, Sean brings up this idea that we talked about, right? This kind of portal, portal, uh, you know, protection for traveling employees, right? You know, start out in the morning. Until you get home at night, you're a traveling employee that whole time, right? Even, I mean, we've even seen cases where there's been like a little digression, right? The guy goes to the bank, right? And if he's coming out of the bank, parking lot, he gets rear-ended or he's going or whatever it is, right? Like the bank was a personal errand, but he's still a traveling employee, right? So, you know, I, so, so I, I don't think that this concept has fully caught hold yet, but, I mean, we've seen it now at least twice in the last few months. So it seems to be gathering momentum, this idea that when you get to where you're going, you are no longer a traveling employee. You're just like any other employee. You've got to do the employment risk analysis or the neutral risk analysis, right? So if a guy who's traveling goes to California and his job requires him to get to every day and he gets hurt in the motel, Fire truck, she hits some unknown <coughs> ground and twists her knee and, and injures 
um, heard me, right? The um, arbitrator does what the commission is going to call a neutral risk analysis in a second, okay? But I think there's elements here of the arbitrator analyzing this as a employment risk, right? This idea that she, the fire truck is higher than normal, right? Trying to get out of a fire truck is higher than normal. It's an employment-related kind of risk, right? Because a fire truck is particular to firefighters, right? I don't have to get out of a fire truck every day. Firefighter um, does. So there are elements of the arbitrator's decision that I suppose could be an analysis of employment related risk. I suppose that um, there are also elements that are this, you know, quantitative or qualitative neutral risk analysis. You know, fire trucks are different than regular trucks, and she's got to get in and out of fire trucks a lot as a firefighter, right? So either which way, employment related risk, neutral risk, um, either which way this petitioner is covered according to uh, the arbitrator. But the commission says, yes, we're, we're going to award benefits to this firefighter, but we disagree with the analysis of the arbitrator. All right? So the commission says the arbitrator used a neutral risk analysis in order to get to the result of compensability here, but we don't think that that is applicable here because Firefighters are traveling employees, all right? Even though she got to where she's going, right? To the fire or to the emergency, right? To get out of the truck, right? The commission says in this case, firefighters, and I suppose that at some point, somebody's gonna cite this as kind of a rule of law, right? Firefighters are traveling employees, right? And therefore, you don't have to do the employment risk analysis. You don't have to do the neutral risk analysis. Was it higher? Was it more times in and out of the truck, right? All you have to say is, is it reasonable and foreseeable that firefighters will fall out of fire trucks? And the answer apparently is yes, in which case it's compensable, right? So it's, it's an interesting case in my opinion because there's a disagreement or at least a difference of opinion between the commission and the arbitrator and in this particular case, the commission decided that even though a firefighter was where she was going to, right, that she was still considered to be a traveling employee at that time. All right, any questions, concerns, issues about this one? Was, was she answering a call? Were they, I mean, yeah, I, think, I, I, I don't think it was a fire truck. I think it was like a, a, car, a car accident or something. Still, she's on the job. Well, sure, but... It, so Mark says, she's on the job, right? So the accident didn't work. But, right, the respondent argued, yeah, but that's only half the equation, right? That's only, well, I'm, I'm telling you, it's all right? this is the whole equation. It's the whole no, equation. No, it's, right? I mean, what are we doing here, guys, right? In the course of and arising out, right? Here's the short one. So this just, is just because I'm exposed to walking on the pavement and stepping on a crack the same way she's, she's on the job, she's jumping off the... Yeah, but Mark, so was Miss Watkins on the job, so to speak, right? That, that gate, right, the first case we saw, that wasn't about in the course of, that was about arising out of, she was in the course of. So if you're saying every fall that a person has in the course of their employment, I wish that were the law, right? <laughs> I this is the law. That's what I think the law should be. This is jumping off the fire truck onto a... But, but 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 you still have to analyze that back under the arising out of prong, right? Yes. So right. So, so, so the, the 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 arbitrator says he he looks at this as can I put words in your mouth? An employment risk, right? A firefighter getting out of a fire truck is by definition. An employment risk. We didn't have to talk about neutral risk analysis, how many times, how high was it, right? A firefighter getting out of a fire truck is an employment related risk. I, I would agree with that statement, okay? Apparently, the arbitrator did agree with that statement. The arbitrator said, I'm going to do a neutral risk analysis here just in case, right? And then the commission said, you didn't even have to do that because it's a traveling employee and the risk analysis is reasonable and foreseeable. So, 
I'm, 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 I'm going to just move on and then we'll come back for the questions, okay? Because I, I want to get to at least a couple more cases. This one I think is really interesting, um, and I think it really deserves some discussion. So, um, I believe that these lots versus Mid American growers. So, you don't have this slide in your package, I'm sorry, but I, I thought that maybe describing the facts would put this case in a little bit better perspective. So, the petitioner has an accident in September of 2011. She tries uh, her first 19B in November of 2014. She is awarded TTD and passed in prospective medical as a result of that 19B in 2014. After the um, award in the 19B, she receives treatment from Dr. Orteza, which is apparently that prospective medical that she was awarded in that uh, 19 <coughs> decision. Dr. Orteza does a couple of these injections on her and then decides that she needs something called an innervation procedure. I, I, I'm sure you all know what that means. I'm not sure I, I know what that is. An innervation procedure. So apparently when the um, the innervation procedure is recommended. The respondent refuses to authorize the innervation procedure, even though the petitioner had already won uh, a 19B. And in February of 2018, the respondent files a 19B. Right? So this is one of those reverse 19Bs that we have heard tell of. Right? Um, that apparently this was a reverse 19B. So what does that tell us about the petitioner's TTD status at the time that reverse 19B was filed? Let's see how many of you are familiar with reverse 19B. Right, the OT, right? Uh, the TTD was ongoing. So right, right? So the TTD says the TTD was ongoing as of that date, right? How do we know that? Because that's the only circumstance under which a respondent can file a reverse 19B, right? The Act tells us that. It says if TTD is being paid and if it's up to date, you can file a reverse 19B respondent to you know, discuss compensability or causation or necessity or whatever, but you better be paying TTD as of the date that you file that reverse 19B. So that's what happens. The respondent files a reverse 19B. Um, the arbitrator, in this case, denies the respondent's 19B, right, and says that the petitioner is entitled to ongoing TTD and to prospective medical treatment, that denervation procedure that Dr. Orteza had recommended. The commission reverses that decision and cuts off the TTD and the medical on September 18, 2015. What's significant about that date? Is anybody, anybody awake? Anybody following me here? Right? What's significant about that date? Right? That date is two and a half years before the respondent filed the reverse 19B. Guess what? Credit. Right? Guess what? Credit. Right? So, this is an important case to take a look at. So let's, so let's take a look at it, right? Here's what the commission says. Although the commission affirms the finding of causal connection, it also views the evidence slightly differently from the arbitrator and terminates, look at the word that the commission uses here, terminates causal connection on September 18, 2015, okay? <coughs> We agree with causal connection, but we terminate causal connection. I'm, I'm, I'm still having a hard time squaring those two concepts in my mind, but that's what the commission decision says. So, as we lawyers always do when we're trying a second 19B, right? We always try to hide under the shadow or the protection of the law of the case, right? Hey, it's the law of the case. Causation is the law of the case already. I already proved my case, right? Accidents, law of the case. Uh, TTD is law of the case. Law of the case, law of the case, right? Well, uh, the commission says a review of the facts indicates that the law of the case doctrine does not apply in this case. 
That's the ruling in the initial 19B hearing has been satisfied. The petitioner was able to undergo both uh, injections, but neither provided the necessary results with which to continue treatment. Okay, so everybody catch what the commission is saying here, right? What they're saying is, yeah, law of the case, fine. You got what you were entitled to under that 19B. You got your TTE up to the date of the hearing, right, of that first 19B. You got your prospective medical, those two injections that were authorized under the 19B. But that's all you get under that first 19B. You don't get some special, you know, leg up or anything like that, right? They paid what they were supposed to under that first 19B. Here's a new 19B, not covered by law of the case. Based on the testimony of her own treatment physician, the petitioner is not entitled to undergo the denervation procedure because she has reached MMI as of the date of that recommendation, right? Where, how does the commission come to that conclusion? They say, look, those first two blocks that she got, those first two injections that the petitioner got, didn't really provide her with much relief, right? So why would this denervation procedure provide her with any relief if those injections didn't provide her with relief? So we believe that she's reached MMI as of the date of that um, recommendation from her treating doctor. Although the longevity of the relief is not noted in that day's medical record, it can be presumed that Dr. Orteza was made aware of or should have been made aware of of the 30 minute time frame of relief. At that time, Dr. Orteza would have known that the innervation procedure was not necessary. Okay, so they're making a finding that the procedure was not necessary, but here comes the next step. Accordingly, the commission finds that the causal connection should be terminated as of September 18, 2015. So, at least in my mind, there is a bit of a conflict between those last two statements. Right? They're saying we're denying it because it's not necessary, which would have been enough to deny it. But then they go on to say that somehow, because it was not necessary, that that terminates the causal connection. So I, I'm having a hard time reconciling those things in my mind. In, and, here, and here comes the next shooter drop, right? In keeping with the causal connection that we just found that it's terminated as of that date, causal connection is terminated as of the commission modifies the TTD award and finds that the MNI date is that very same date, right? And guess what? Although TTD is terminated on September 18, 2015, the picture wasn't working at that time, right? She was not entitled uh, to maintenance benefits at that time. Why? Because the petitioner did not engage in a vocational rehabilitation program, nor did she perform a job search. Thus, there is no basis to award maintenance. So, I mean, does everybody get the picture? Uh, and, and I know I'm—I I know I'm a petitioner's lawyer. I know I'm horribly biased. But does everybody get what happened to this petitioner? She tries and wins a 19B, right? And is receiving the medical treatment that she's entitled to receive under that 19B, receiving TTD that is voluntarily being paid by the respondent. The respondent files a reverse 19B, and the commission sets a cutoff date for that TTD that she was receiving two and a half years earlier. Okay? Um, there, I, I don't know how to advise clients when I, when I look at this case. If they say to me, I got hurt yesterday, should I be looking for a job today? I think my, I think the, the best advice I can give them is you better be looking for a job. Because if you get caught in a situation where somebody says your MMI date was retroactive to another date, right, and you haven't been looking for a job, you have no argument for maintenance according to cases like this. Okay? So Other than my she should have had a review of the 1951 of the 
since he won that, continued to file 19 Bs. Well, I, I mean, but, but I, Mark, I'm, I'm not even sure she would be, I, I, I'm not even sure she'd be entitled to file an ID. She's receiving benefits. Uh, this is totally cheap. I mean, what, uh, absent that, I don't know what you could do. Yeah, but question. Yes. Was there a doctor who testified that the innervation was not necessary? Yeah, there, there was a, the, Dr. Lewis was the IME in this case, but the commission actually rejected Dr. Lewis. They said Dr. Lewis is not credible, and the reason why Dr. Lewis is not credible more than anything else is he said the commission decided that first 19 be wrong. There was really no, there was really no causation. So the commission completely rejected let, let, let me just quickly get through. So the Zaleski case, the reason why this case is really important is it's an analysis of that Jackson Park Hospital case that we talked about, right, that said that even if the petitioner is making exactly the same amount of money as he was making before um, he got hurt, he still could be entitled to a wage differential because wage differential is supposed to look at earning capacity as opposed to what the petitioner is actually making, right? Um, in this case, the arbitrator said, I'm applying Jackson Park to award the petitioner a wage differential, but the commission took it away. The commission said, look, if the guy's working in a job that's making him as, as much as he was before the injury, then um, we're, ch we're choosing to distinguish Jackson Park Hospital in this case, and he's not entitled to the wage differential. Instead, the commission awarded him a 30% loss of use of him. And as a whole, I think this is one of the first cases that the commission has done a, an analysis of Jackson Park Hospital case, so you may want to take a quick look at this. Kristen Roy is a um, is a, a DPD case. It's an analysis of Section 8.1B. I think that this case is important because of the language that the commission uses. So again, this is a case where the commission says we're going to affirm the arbitrator's decision, but we're going to write a dip. we're going to write a different decision because we don't think the arbitrator got it quite right. So look at the way the, our, the commission analyzes the five factors under Section 8.1b. They, they use this phrase that I think is one of the first times I've seen it. This idea that the commission finds this way in favor of decreased permanency or the commission finds this way in favor of an increased permanence, right? So that, that's a phrase that this commission decision uses and it's a pretty decent explanation of the commission's analysis of section 8.1b. So I wanted to finish with this case because it's a penalties case. So in this case, the petitioner is awarded penalties by the arbitrator because the Respondent has unreasonably denied benefits for over a year, disputing accident and causation. The arbitrator awards benefits because she finds that the petitioner um, should have been receiving benefits uh, all along. Um, respondent did not pay TTD until more than a year after the accident. The respondent had not obtained any Section 12 examination. Respondent placed accident and notice in dispute at the time of the hearing, but did not offer any evidence to support those defenses. Right, so this idea that accident's in dispute, but there's no evidence about why the accident should be in dispute, that was very significant to this arbitrator when she awarded the uh, penalty. The commission takes away the penalty, okay? And here's what the commission says. The commission says the reason we're taking away the penalties is because the petitioner is not credible. Even though he wins his case, he's credible enough to, to win his case, he's not credible enough when it comes to penalties, and this is why. Respondent disputed this claim and questions petitioner's credibility from the outset. So I suppose it's better to question from the outset than to question at some point after you've done the investigation, right, to determine whether you should have a dispute regarding credibility, but that's fine. I review respondent explains. So here's the respondent, and I'm going to do a joke here. Man explaining, right, why they uh, didn't pay benefits in this case. There were reasons to dispute the accident from the beginning. Okay, let's hear the reasons. No witnesses confirmed the accident. Unwitnessed accident. 99.9% .9 of the accidents, unwitnessed accidents, okay. But that, in the commission's mind, is a reason to dispute the petitioner's credibility. And in fact, 
the petitioner did not call any co-worker to testify. Okay? So he says, I got hurt at, he raises his right hand and says, I got hurt at work, right? And there's no contrary evidence whatsoever, but he is somehow required to corroborate his undisputed uh, testimony. Right? <laughs> the petitioner 